basketball is my favorite sport. And I quite do like the way they dribbled up and down the court. I like the slam dunks. You could take me to the hoop. And my favorite play, it just might be the alley-oop. I like the... Shut that shit up. You are not a little bow wow, buddy. Now to me, it seems that basketball has been around forever. And my earliest memories involve playing the sport as well as watching the NBA. But sometimes I think, how did all of this come to be? Well, to answer that question I just posed, let's move our timeline to 1891 and learn about how this handsome young man made basketball. James Naismith was seeing his students bored as hell because it was cold and raining, meaning they couldn't play football or lacrosse because of the conditions. Mr. James couldn't stand to see his students restless and wet. Pause. Oh my god, who cares about this dumb Canadian? Hey buddy, you better respect James Naismith. I don't want to hear that disrespect come out of your mouth again. Oh yeah, by the way, the inventor of basketball is Canadian, so if you're arguing with someone on the internet about how only one country in the world really plays basketball, please let them know. Anyways, because of how wet it was, James was forced to cook up something entirely new. And Cookie did. He studied immensely, putting in some real dedication and pain into crafting this new sport. And this is what he came up with. He grabbed two peach baskets and nailed them up about 10 feet high because I guess he thought 10 was a cool number or something, I don't know, and used a soccer ball to score. Like a forward who played for the Jazz during the 90s, he also had a fascination with the number 13 as he put in play 13 original rules. What are those 13 rules you may be asking? I don't know, Google is free buddy. This is the history of the NBA, not the history of James Naismith. All I know is that originally dribbling wasn't even part of the 13 rules and they added it in 1892. They would uh, kinda just stand there and pass the ball around like an obscure version of Ultimate Frisbee I guess. Anyways, let's talk about how the NBA was on its path to getting formed. It wasn't until 1895 when basketball first started becoming an established and somewhat recognizable sport. Basketball began getting played in high schools during this time. And it makes me wonder how many people joined these teams as a joke, calling it a random ass sport. In 1901, college basketball was played all throughout the country, and it was around this time that James Naismith decided to lock in and made Tim Duncan's whole career by inventing the backboard. He also made people actually able to not have the ball slip out of their hands by changing the material used for it to leather. Finally, to complete the sport from looking like some random shit kids invented, like wall ball. Wait, this is a real sport that people actually play at the Olympics now? Sorry to all my wall ballers out there. I wasn't familiar with your game. Anyways, yeah, they had a rim and a hoop with a net instead of just a peach basket so it could look more professional. We're getting close to the NBA part, guys. I swear. In the 1920s, multiple leagues and groups around America were beginning to be formed. The most popular one being the Harlem Globetrotters, who helped popularize what was considered at the time a poverty sport. Now finally, in 1937, the National Basketball League was formed. This is important to the NBA, I swear. After a little under the decade, in 1946, a new league was formed that was meant to compete with the NBL, called the BAA. Now what does the BAA stand for? I guess it's supposed to mimic a sheep noise because they joined the herd with the NBL finally in 1949 forming the National Basketball Association or the NBA. Holy shit, finally the intro's done with that's the longest intro I've ever done. Now the inaugural season for the NBA was the 1949-1950 season. And the NBA in the 50s is a very undocumented place. I mean a lot of shit happened but there's not a lot of specifics. Now to start with, there's a lot of discrepancies when you put certain terms into Google which will make it look like I'm off the henny and have no clue what I'm talking about, but I assure you, I'm not J.R. Smith and there's a good reason for this. The reason being is I don't believe whether it's official or not that the BAA seasons were recognized as part of NBA history by the NBA itself. If it is, that means the first official season is the 46-47 season, but this is my video so I'm saying the first official season is the 49-50 season. And if you have a problem with that, go make your own video, because I'll be the first one to tell you. This shit is a mission. Anyways, the 49-50 season started with 17 teams and 3 divisions with the top 4 in each division making the playoffs. Among these names are two recognizable ones being the New York Knicks and the Denver Nuggets. Then we also have the eventual champions, the Minneapolis Lakers, of course, the modern day LA Lakers. Now the GOAT of this era is George Mikan because Melanin wasn't introduced into the league yet and because he grabbed every single offensive rebound every single time he missed. He was so dominant a few rules actually changed because of him. I mean, goaltending was invented because Blood just held his hand in front of the rim and cock blocked any and every shot attempt. Anyways, the Minneapolis Lakers dominated the league until Mikan retired winning 4 of the 5 championships he played in until 1954, and the one year that they didn't win, the Rochester Royals did, in 1951. Or they're better known as the current day, Sacramento Kings. Light the beam baby, my Kings only win. Just don't talk about the years from 2006 to 2022. Nothing happened in those years, I promise. Anyways, the year Mike and retired in 1954 also brought with it an important rule change, being the shot clock. You know it was really important because LMI dropped one of her most mid songs about it. The shot clock had to be introduced so the games weren't so low scoring due to some pussy teams like the Fort Piston Waynes just holding the ball every time they got a lead. And look on your screen right now, because this is a real game. 19 to 18. 
Imagine your first introduction to the NBA being this game right here. You would have got pissed off because they're just standing there the whole time. They're just standing there looking at each other. There, there's a good reason why we have a shot clock now. It's probably the most important rule change the NBA has made. It made the league go from competitive staring to actually playing basketball. Now it's about all I got from the 50s, so let's get into the 60s. Now to talk about the second ever dynasty and the first ever super team, that being the 60s Celtics, we gotta start with Bob Cousy, Bill Russell, and this other random I heard about in an NBA YouTube video. So yeah, they came together to win the first Celtics championship in 1957, then they lost the next year, but won again in 1959, which coincidentally is when the next big name joined the league, Wilt Chamberlain. This man straight up dominated the league. I mean, he averaged 50 points in one season, dropped 100 points in one game, and averaged more than 20 rebounds a game throughout his entire career. But it's crazy how all of those stats pale in comparison to his off-the-court stats because he said that he slept with 20,000 women. Fuck 100 points. This dude was raw dogging every single night with multiple women. And I respect it. But to talk about his NBA career again, he was stuck a lot of the time with a mediocre squad, which led him to losing to Bill Russell almost every single time he was in the playoffs and even in the regular season. But this was good for the league as it sparked the first ever rivalry and led to narratives surrounding the game, which is so common today. Anyways, the Celtics were pure domination, having all-star caliber players coming off the bench, leading to 8 straight championships. That shit was kinda disgusting. Will Chamberlain had to put a stop to that shit and decided to stop banging 6 women every night and instead win a championship in 1967 where he mimicked 2018 LeBron, except he actually won it all. After Bill Russell won, the Celtics then won 2 straight again, but the dynasty ended in 1969, which is the last year Bill Russell played and the last year they won the championship. RIP Bill Russell and RIP Will Chamberlain. Their impact is larger than life and we still see their impact on the sport today. This era paved the way for so much to come for the future of the sport, and I almost forgot, in 1960 some guy named Jerry West joined the league, but his impact isn't that major though, we don't really see him that often. As one legend in Bill Russell leaves, another enters, because in 1969 the Milwaukee Bucks got one of the greatest players ever, with that of course being Lou Wall Cinder. Who the fuck is that? My bad, the Bucks got Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, this guy hooked demon. Look at these highlights. Kareem was the equivalent of your one friend who exclusively plays one character in a fighting game and absolutely abuses that character. Like this shit was unbelievably unfair. Look at all of these highlights. He was dominating. No one can stop him. In fact, Kareem was so dominant that they actually took out dunking for a decade in the NCAA because he would damage the hoops so often that they couldn't afford to repair them. I would be on hots if I had to guard this man every night back in those days. Imagine getting off your 9 to 5 electrician job and then realizing you have to play Kareem Abdul-Jabbar at 7 that same night. I would have just ended it at all, like there, there's no reason to go on at that point. Speaking of economics, there's an elephant in the room that I haven't been addressing so far, that being the economical status of the NBA, so it's time to mimic Agent Zero and pocket watch the league. Now the reason why people call players of the early NBA plumbers is because they most likely were. I mean shit, they had to put food on the table somehow, and the NBA wasn't doing it. From the 1950s to the 1970s, most NBA players did not earn livable wages whatsoever. But this started to change in the 70s with the NBA quickly becoming the biggest growing American sports league and starting to spread worldwide also. With the sport gaining worldwide popularity, the highest paid NBA player in the 1970 season was starting to bring in a quarter of a million annually with that being Kareem. So finally, these NBA players weren't part-time basketball players and full-time electricians, but full-time basketball players and maybe part-time electricians. But to continue with the actual basketball, Kareem won his first championship in 1971 to start one of the greatest legacies ever seen in the NBA. And the NBA as a whole was going through a transitional period within the 70s. The league was still heavily dominated by big men and the sport as a whole was expanding. Dribbling rules started becoming a lot more lenient, leading to more innovation for guard play and shot creation for players who couldn't dominate the post and use their strength to their advantage and their ungodly height. This will be very important going forward. The 70s also was a time of parody in the NBA, which was much needed after the absolute god squads that were assembled in the 50s and 60s. I mean, watching the NBA back then must have been like watching the fully healthy Warriors after adding KD for a decade long. An absolute snooze fest. Imagine that for two whole decades. Now addressing the biggest thing to happen during the 70s with that of course being the ABA and NBA merger in 1976. This was the biggest move the league has made thus far. They basically had a monopoly on all of the basketball talent now. If this merger never went through, we might see the professional scene of basketball look more like soccer with highly talented and skilled leagues all throughout the world instead of it being dominated by one specific league. This decision went against this by congregating all the top talent in the NBA and voiding ABA history. The four teams that joined are all current day NBA teams with the Denver Nuggets, San Antonio Spurs, Indiana Pacers, and at the time, the New York Knicks who are of course the Brooklyn Nets now. Anyways, enough of the merger, let's talk about an insignificant rule change in the 1979 season with that being the three point line. 
this definitely won't change the game for the rest of its history. The 1979 NBA season was a very significant one for the NBA, because in addition to adding the three-point line, they also added Larry Bird and Magic Johnson to the league as they were going into their rookie years, which those two, in my opinion, changed the game forever and showed that the NBA isn't heavily dominated by big men and they could be dominated by players who have more traditional guard-like skills with Magic Johnson and then Larry Bird being more of a wing type player. But still, at least it isn't a seven foot guy dominating the league anymore. Starting now, in my opinion, is when the game came to what we recognize it to be today, the 80s. The start of the 80s saw the highest earning NBA player making a million dollars annually, as well as the league adding a new expansion team in the Dallas Mavericks. That now made 23 total teams within the league. This was when basketball went from just another sport to one of the sports in America, along with baseball and football. Whether you loved Larry Bird stroking that thing, or you loved the way Magic Johnson handled balls, you had to agree the best part was watching them play each other. In my opinion, after researching for this video, I have to agree this was the best player rivalry we've ever had in the history of the sport. Larry Bird was such a shit talker and Magic Johnson was one of the best players to step on the court from the moment he was drafted. These players undeniably hold up today. I mean, look at these Larry Bird's highlights. They speak for themselves. These two helped change the game from being so center dominant to start letting smaller players dominate the league. Although both were still pretty tall with Magic Johnson being a 6'9 point guard and Larry Bird being a 6'9 wing. The Lakers in this decade won five championships with Kareem and Magic being the best duo in the sport. Kareem being so dominant that he made a record no one would ever break again when he retired in 1989, amassing a career total of 38,387 points. Again, this era was straight cooking. David Stern became commissioner in 1984, which led him to making the league so much more global. He also allegedly rigged quite a few things according to numerous sources, but hey, at least he made the sport entertaining. I can't complain. Common Stern W. Speaking of 1984, we have arguably the greatest talent ever assembled in one draft, with one man ready to change the sport as we know it and become a global icon. Michael Jeffrey Jordan. Among Jordan there was Kareem, a San Antonio woman hater, and Johnny Stockton. Again. I have to say it, this was the most prosperous time the league has seen up to this point. It seems like an old head and I'm glazing the good old days, but I promise I'm not. I'm actually hella young and I usually glaze LeBron. But amongst all of this, there is one key problem occurring throughout the league, with that being the widespread, um, let's just say for monetization purposes, widespread Coca-Cola drinking throughout the league. The NBA estimated that in 1980, around 40-75% to of the entire league indulged in Coca-Cola sipping. This was specifically tragic as some players were going to prison for possession and in some cases entire lives being ruined as in 1986 the second overall draft pick passed away due to it. R.I.P. Len Bias. The stigma of the NBA being full of addicts was one that made it extremely hard for the league to demand higher salary and TV deals or sponsorships. This was the one thing that prevented the NBA from taking the jump that it truly deserved and delayed it until the 90s. That was because one man made it impossible for anyone around the whole entire world to ignore the league. And this was regardless of whether or not you even watched the sport to begin with. But before we get into that, we have to talk about the four new expansion teams within the decade, with that being the Hornet, Heat, Timberwolves, and Magic, bringing the team total to 27 now. Finally, we can get into the most iconic era the NBA has seen, where everyone was captivated by one team, and to be specific, one player. Now if you're a bronze sexual like I am, I highly recommend skipping this part of the video as it's nothing but doing tricks on it for Jordan if I'm going to be honest with you. And I originally didn't even plan on glazing it this much, but in doing research, he truly did make the NBA into a more recognizable league across the entire world and not just America, which is why we have players like Luka Doncic and Nikola Jokic dominating the league right now. Jordan dominated the 90s alongside the Bulls after continually losing to the Pistons within his early years in the league. He was hyper athletic with a phenomenal mid-range shot and a great post game. When the Bulls won three championships in a row and he retired on top of the world, he left a large impact on the sport. I mean, he had a season where his team only lost 10 games. Everyone had to be there to witness his greatness that was on display every night from him and the Bulls. His impact was so large, many felt like there was a huge void in the league after he left. People were craving to see more of him. Especially since now, Larry Bird was retired and Magic Johnson felt a burn every time he took a piss. So, when he said simply, I'm back, the sports world was in utter shock. After Jordan said I'm back, he proceeded to win three more, leaving with the most iconic push-off in league history. I'm just kidding. I don't know if it's a push-off or not. Y'all can argue in the comments. I don't really care. Jordan also had a shoe brand which helped push just how global the sport became. I mean, Nike is arguably one of the biggest and most recognizable brands in the world today. And if we're going to be honest, Nike was on a whole lot of nothing before they signed Jordan to the roster, making it a revolutionary brand. The 90s saw the highest popularity of the NBA ever, surpassing even when Larry Bird and Magic Johnson were continually going at it. Even besides Michael Jordan, the other players surrounding the NBA made the NBA's future brighter than ever, with players like Shaq and Allen Iverson entering the league. 
Not to mention the next face of the league, Kobe Bryant, entering in 1996. Basketball truly flourished in these years. Dribbling became as lenient as ever with Allen Iverson revolutionizing ball handling. And in all, you could say the 90s was a culmination of all the hard work the predecessors put into the sport and the league finally paying off in a major way. Finally, to end this talk about the 90s, we have a direct showing of how popular the sport got outside of America, with Canada getting two expansion teams in the Raptors and the Grizzlies, which eventually, of course, moved into Memphis. So finally, I think it's time we get into the 2000s. Basketball at this point was a cultural phenomenon for up to 20 years at this point. The 90s made it extremely popular in music, media, commercials, and many more. Whoever you were, it was hard to avoid the league or basketball in any totality. The NBA was so much more than a league that had basketball players, but had actual icons up to this point. Although, with Michael Jordan leaving the sport, the most captivating thing about the league at this point was Kobe and Shaq teaming together on the Los Angeles Lakers. So there's really nothing to do to popularize the sport, right? Well. Actually, there was, because in 2003, my snookums, spooky, bubba bubbly bear LeBron Raymond James entered the league and became my glorious sweet monarch immediately. He struck not only my heart, but everyone's heart who decided to watch him. LeBron was, at the time, the most hyped up prospect in the history of the sport. The writers went to his high school and talked about him like a fucking anime character, talking about the chosen one. Blood is not Gojo, man. Get that out of my ear. Personally, from my perspective, this era of the NBA was when the NBA shifted to being a superstar-driven league. This could be due to social media finally coming around, making it easier to spread narratives about each player, but I feel like it could just be a lot of widespread talent from the guard positions, the forward position, and the center position, which we've never seen before. So many talented players at so many different positions, and they were all just cultural icons because of social media, journalism, and everything else reaching its peak. This also is when a lot of prominent sports media personalities started having their come-ups too, like Stephen A and Skip Bayless changing the way we talk about ball to this day. We also got our latest expansion team in the Charlotte Hornets who are still yet to do anything substantial, unfortunately, but at least that brings our team total to 30 now, which means we're up to modern day teams. And I really don't have much to say for this era because this was the time I started watching basketball and then NBA personally, so it's hard for me to speak on this part of the league in totality in a revisionist sort of way like I did before. It's actually kind of making me feel old to realize this entire era is 20 years ago at this point, and a lot of newer fans know close to nothing about it. I guess one thing to talk about is just how much money players are starting to make now. The 90s saw the first ever players to make $10 million annually, and then the 2000s doubled that with the highest earning players making $20 million a year annually, not to mention all the other endorsement contacts and deals that these players also probably got. This is a far cry from the time being an NBA player was actually just a part-time job. Another thing to speak on and note is just how this is really a transitional period for the league, as this was one of the lowest scoring eras in history and one of the lowest paced, and scoring as a whole has been on decline in the league since the 80s, although it truly reached its peak within these years as the pace was very slow and there are many low scoring games. Speaking of these years, it was complete domination for the Lakers and Spurs as they combined for 6 out of the 10 championships gained throughout this decade, starting the absolute dominance that was the Western Conference in the NBA. Finally, something that happened that is also very important in today's league is the start of trade requests within the league, happening in 2006 when Allen Iverson requested out. Anyways, I think it's time to catch up to current day. Before the turn of the decade, in 2010, a certain player would be drafted that in the grand scheme of things may not be as high on the all-time list as others who I put spotlight on, but the impact they had on the game is just as big. And of course, I'm talking about Stephen Curry. As I spoke on before, the NBA was in a transitional phase in the 2000s full of low-scoring games with a slower, methodical pace. This was changing in the 2010s though because of a small rule change I talked about earlier. You know, the one about how if you have your feet behind a certain line and shoot it, it's worth more points? Yeah, that rule change actually became significant because the team that would dominate this era utilized it to its fullest capability as soon as the Heat and Spurs were done winning. Stephen Curry utilized off-ball movement and his unprecedented shooting to take what was the slowly expanding three-point shot from a small, you know, thing that people occasionally shot to the most central part of every offense. Spacing now in today's league is something that your team must have to succeed offensively. Clogging up lanes with players who can't step behind the arc makes offenses fail in the modern era. This new brand of basketball made the Warriors the greatest team in regular season history in 2016 winning 73 games, even beating out the Michael Jordan-led Bulls I talked about earlier. Stephen Curry not only made every 12-year-old want to shoot 70 feet behind the arc to no avail, but he also created the top glazer in the history of the world with fight reacts on his dick every single time he does anything, literally anything. But with this Warriors team winning 73 games in one season led by Stephen Curry, nothing could have possibly ruined their season, right? Besides my sweet King James. The 2016 season had the greatest storyline ever, I don't care. Be ready for my 2016 NBA season in 60 minutes video because it's coming soon, trust. Anyways, the biggest rivalry in this decade was between the Warriors and Cavs, and I'm sure as I ramble on, everyone's thinking, damn, shut that shit up already, we know all this, this only happened a few years ago. 
So I'll keep this part of the video a little more brief than the other decades. But one season I do want to speak on is the 2019 season because it was the first time in NBA history a team outside the USA won the championship. And it was quite possibly the greatest celebration in NBA history in Toronto. Finally, let's get into the 2020s and talk about what they've held so far. The Lakers won in 2020 in a bubble or something. I don't know. Some people say it's a Mickey Mouse trophy. I don't know. A Greek man who in 10 years time might deserve his own section of the video, like other people, won a championship for the Bucks. And finally, the Warriors got another title. Oh yeah, and the Denver Nuggets won a championship this past season, led by Jokic. <coughs> 2023 NBA season in 23 minutes. Conclusion. The state of the NBA right now is in the best place it has ever been, as I see it. You know, you can argue with me, your mom, your grandma, I don't really care because how I see it, it's in the best state there is. There's more parity in this league than there ever was, with every team that has won the championship so far this decade being different. The sport is much more global than it ever has been, being the third most popular sport in the whole entire world, with so many foreign talents dominating the league as we know it. Which speaking of, makes me excited to see Victor Wembanyama, the most hyped up prospect in the history of team sports in this upcoming season in 2024. All in all, this league really has made unforgettable memories for millions across the globe, along with bringing people together in totality. This sport is truly magical and helps so many people. And this video is a token of my gratitude to everyone who made this sport this big. We have to say thank you to everyone who came before the athletes we know today. I can't imagine living in a world where there isn't a basketball court in almost every park where I live. I know there is quite a lot of stuff I did not mention about the league, like the G League or how Yao Ming popularized the sport in China. I don't think I said Kevin Durant's to name the whole video surprisingly. But anyways, I'm getting sidetracked. If there's something crucial you think I forgot, leave it in the comments. And besides that, here's the ending message for this time. You know, recently I've been getting in my own head a lot about things that may or may not be true or things that may or may not even matter. I've been thinking that maybe I'm destined to not succeed as majorly as I thought I once would, or that maybe I'm more alone than I thought I was. But whatever it is, I've just been thinking really negatively. It really has been affecting my mood. The thought that life is so hard and full of pain, struggles, or whatever hardships you may face, and that they all in all may plague your existence, has been one that I really haven't been able to get off my mind. The only way I was able to get it off my mind was to think about things in a different light. You know, life really is similar to building puzzles, except you really don't get the picture on the box. You just keep putting pieces together and it may or may not fit. You rearrange them, continue, and continue, but when you finally finish, the satisfaction is beyond belief. Kind of similar to how without struggle or hardships, we wouldn't be able to feel true happiness or success. The happiness of our lives are found through waiting out the desperation and fear to make it to the moments of clarity and fulfillment. Without struggle, we wouldn't be able to feel such emotions. I truly am glad I'm able to experience every emotion I've talked about, even if it does mean enduring something a little more miserable. Because when you reach the feeling of accomplishment after all that, it truly is incomprehensible to describe the feeling. So please, keep going. You owe yourself that much. Great things and endless possibilities are around the corner waiting for you.